welcome to SciGest, your fortnightly serving of digestible science from plant and food research. Kia ora, I'm Jessica Rodriguez and you're listening to It's a Science Life for Me, a careers podcast series from plant and food research. Today's episode is a mashup of career advice from our chat with Professor Juliet Gerard, the Prime Minister's Chief Science Advisor. We include gems that came up while Blue Plunkett Andrew Day and I sat in Juliet's office in front of a wall plastered with post-its of scribbled thoughts from around the country as we asked Juliet about her role as Chief Science Advisor and some of the issues faced by New Zealand and scientists. You can hear more about that at length in our Science Movers and Shakers series. We also include some new material about how her personal journey into science began and her advice for aspiring scientists. Her impressive career path includes scholarship-funded undergraduate and graduate degrees from the prestigious Oxford University in the UK, a move across the world to plant and food research in Christchurch, a transition back to academia at Canterbury University, successful projects funded by Marsden Grants Industry and the US Army, leadership roles on several boards and committees, a move to the University of Auckland, the founding of her own startup company, and now her appointment as the Prime Minister's Chief Science Advisor. Without further ado, Let's head back to Juliet's office. Welcome, Juliet. Kia ora. But, um, I guess going back to the beginning, where did your interest in science start? Yeah, I'm not sure I've really got an aha moment that some people have when I realized I was a scientist, but it, I've always really liked trying to figure out how things work. And I think, um, I think my grandfather was probably the most influential person, although he wasn't a scientist. He left school when he was 12, but he always used to do things in his shed pull apart radios and put them back together and set up seeds in a tray so that he could water some more and some less and look at the sunshine. So I think I was always sort of brought up to think like that. And it was at school that I got nurtured, but it was always science, really. Do you think that following a scientific path is all about having confidence and curiosity that's quite innate to all of us? Yeah, making sure that doesn't get extinguished, I guess. So I suspect lots of kids are quite sciencey by nature because they want to know how things work. But the way they're taught and the way they're um, socialized maybe means that they, they don't pursue it. Going through your CV, you've you know studied at some of the best places in the world. Do you think that you've always been a, a high achiever? Depends how you count. I guess I always got good grades. And so I was lucky that the thing that got measured when I was at school was the thing I was good at. I think if you put me through now, I might be less good at some of the things that get measured. Was a lot of your academic journey planned or was it just following opportunities that arose at the time? I was pretty bad at planning, still am. So I've always been a Caesar of opportunities. Um, And I tend to say yes, not no, but I didn't really ever have a very well structured plan. I'm not a good role model in that sense. Well, I guess it, maybe it's, it pays to not have a very well-structured plan because it does seem, looking back at your CV, that your role and the particular tasks that you performed have evolved over the years from being a, a bench lab scientist to being a professor to now interacting with policymakers. So what's your take on the varied roles that you've performed and maybe whether there were certain personality aspects of yours that were, that were suited to it? I think I'm unusually extroverted for a scientist. And that's been really helpful at various times. Um, It's particularly helpful now because I meet a huge number of different people and I'm very relaxed meeting new people. I think if I was a classic, stereotypical, introverted scientist, it would be much more energy draining. And what's the thing that you love most about the different roles you've had? So I guess, you know, what, what have you loved most about being a scientist? What do you love most about being the prime minister's chief science advisor? Just variety and learning new things. So I get bored quite easily. So all my different roles have brought in something different and I've learned something. So I spun out a little company. Um, I worked at Callahan for a while. I worked at Crop and Food way back when. I've been on the board of Plant and Food. And then this role is completely different again. So in each case, science has been at the core, but I've used really different skills and interacted with different people. And that's been fun. Throughout this time, how have you balanced your family life with um, your work life and your interests? I don't sleep a lot. (laughs) <laughs> which is again not a good role model <laughs> um, and I've never been particularly good at having work-life boundaries so I've enjoyed my work and I've enjoyed my kids and I've muddled them up so my kids used to help me proofread postgraduate theses and things so wow. I don't know whether that's a good thing for them or for the postgrad but <laughs> well so what ages were they at when they were proofreading postgrad theses like my, my parents still have problems when I send them things Oh, they weren't very informed comments, so I don't know, probably about eight. I remember my daughter once writing HPLC is not a word, 
<laughs> that, no, that's, that's great advice. <laughs> Being a young mom myself, I can see with my own experience that it definitely changed the way I think, the way I interact with other people, the way I view things that occur in society. And I wonder if you felt the same, uh, a point to be made that it's it's a bigger disadvantage in uh, in the in the working world to be a mother than to be a woman. So I think that, you know, the fact that you've achieved as much as you have and have had two children that you obviously have great relationships with. I read somewhere that your daughter was your unofficial social media guru when you first started the job yeah um so uh, you know stop th- over posting mum <laughs> <laughs> good feedback yeah no and, and so it's it's great i guess that you've been able to incorporate both areas of your life in a in a um i guess a beneficial way so i, I was just wondering if you could share more on what your experiences um, have been as a as a mum and a woman in science and whether you think that benefits your current role Yes, yeah, so I think you're right about being a mother being harder than being female. So I discovered feminism when I had kids, partly because I was on maternity leave and I had time to read, but also because people treated me very differently. That was the first time I felt a gendered response. And people would say, shouldn't you be home with your kids? Um, in a very benign and supportive way, but it was also slightly undermining. I found it really helpful because if you can deal with two toddlers, you can deal with an academic staff meeting. It's the same sort of thing. <laughs> so you can't say go to your room. Maybe a few but, less yeah. nappy changes. But... Not really. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> okay. Um, so I always found that the two fed off each other, really. And also, I've never met a working mum that isn't super efficient. So I think people get a lot more efficient when they have kids. Oh, I yeah. think lots of that's true of dads, too. And I keep saying it'll be great when a woman gets a job like this and doesn't get asked this question or when a guy gets asked, how do you combine fatherhood with your career? (laughs) But we're not there yet. (laughs) Well, what are your views, I guess, as someone who is striving to bring more evidence into policy on, you know, basic gender differences? You know, um, anatomically, our brains are different. You know, going through parenthood, we have different hormonal responses that affect how um, we emotionally interact with the world around us. And how do you think all that should or you know, shouldn't feed into workplace views? Yeah, that's a tricky one. I'm thinking about that recent Mike Hosking, um, I'm going to say outburst, about the global women um, report that said that we didn't have enough women, women on boards. So a lot of those traditional views of what women bring to the workplace were expressed quite strongly in that. I think we have to be really careful because because on average women might be a certain way doesn't mean any particular woman is. And I think the place the evidence base is best used is around diversity. So I think it's pretty incontrovertible that if you have different views around the table, not just gender, but from any lens you look at, you get better decisions. And so that's that's the bit that I think is important to keep saying. So I was on your board for a while as the only woman around the table on either the board or the senior management team because we lost one board member and she didn't get replaced immediately. So the last few months I was literally the only woman in the room talking about diversity. And there's no, it's really hard to argue against the fact that you would get a better starting point of ideas on the table if you had more diverse people around the table. Yep, no, and I, I think it's, um, I don't know if that was advice you gave to our board, but our board definitely has more women, I more culturally diverse now. And yeah. um, we've had two recent science group leader openings, and this is, I guess, a shameless plug for plant and food research. But And both <laughs> of them have been filled by young women who are mothers of children under the age of five. So um, I was very proud as a woman to see that happening in my workplace. Uh, um, you know, of course, I, I sort of, in the back of my mind, do think about what the long-term effects of this are on community structure. That you know, I guess if traditionally women have been, um, you know, more going to the PTA meetings, you know, being that social glue between different families, mm-hmm. then to have women be in the workplace, also have women, you know, look after household affairs. That that's somehow taking away more from that community building role. And I, I wonder what the long-term effects of that will be, but. Hopefully I guess the men are at the PTA meeting. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, and you know, I, it, it, that, I think that that's something that's great to, to kind of push is that now that we've achieved a certain amount of recognition for women to also say, all right, you know, now we need to promote men um, taking on uh, increased roles in the community and in their family life and parenting and other things. Yeah, if they want to. And again, you know, nobody's trying to make a formula, but on average, you'd expect more men to want to do that than maybe do. And I've been back and visited the board. 
oh, for excellent. a dinner. And yeah, I, I help hire those two women. So very different mood around the dinner table than the one I left, which oh, is great. great. Yeah. Um, it sounds like you, you see the the situation of gender equity and equality improving in New Zealand. Do you think that it still has a long ways to go? Depends how you measure. So I had a conversation with the chair of a board, I won't say which one, a couple of weeks ago, and he claimed that it was getting very hard for men in science to get senior roles because everyone was so conscious of needing to hire women. And he cited as evidence the fact that I'm a woman, um, Megan Woods is a woman, the president of the Royal Society is Wendy Lana, she's a woman, and you could go Chief Justice, Prime Minister, Governor General. Um, I took it as a sign of progress that he was feeling disempowered. <laughs> I'm not sure he's completely correct because it doesn't trickle down. So if you look at all the, the layers in an organization, it, there's often a winner at the top, if you call women in that position a win. Um, but it, it's not there, so the layers aren't coming through. So I think we've got a long way to go, but we've, we've made a lot of progress. But I'd rather start looking at other demographics too. Where are the Māori leaders in science? I think the MB diversity statement quotes 2% participation against a population base, which should be something like 2025, depending on how you count. So um, we've got a lot of work to do there. Do you have any ideas about how we can, obviously no silver bullets, but how we can improve the participation rates of these groups? That's one of the things I've been looking at and MB are working on it too. So we've been talking to them. It's hard. So I can go to an an undergraduate audience and encourage the women, but there's not enough Māori scientists there to encourage. There's a few, but, but not enough, not representative. So I think we have to go right back to schools. And there's some great programs out there. So there's this one run out of Massey, but not just for Massey, called the Bahuro STEM program. And they've been just going into classes and pulling out the Māori kids and putting them in a group so that they can bond, have extra tuition, just chat and it's all about seeing people like yourselves right so they're not the only kid in the class that looks like that and I went and talked to them Marai and a really interesting combination of the two worldviews so they absolutely want to make a contribution in science but retain their cultural context. Uh, are any of your kids interested in science? My daughter did social science so nobody went the kind of bench science route. So my son's in recruitment. He's over in Melbourne. And my daughter has just started this week in the Ministry of Social Development. So she did a Bachelor of Arts and then worked on the WINS helpline to get some real life experience. And she's very passionate about social science. Um, you have made comments before about the value of social science and about how, I guess, the questions that they address are important, but much harder than things we do in the lab in some sense. And yeah. so do you feel that, I guess, the kind of network of friends and family that you have have been helpful to you in your various positions as a professor and as an advisor? Yeah, definitely. The other place that I learned about social science was on the Marsden Council. So I used to sit in on all the panel meetings and really listen to the the way different disciplines frame questions and measure excellence and all those things and very different in the social science context and really valuable. Okay, and, and although this podcast is geared towards people aspiring to a career in science research, I think it's important to also bring up the idea that people in the, I guess, the non-hard sciences often feel that there's an unnecessary amount of funding that goes into um, output-focused things like uh, the science, technology, engineering, and math disciplines, what we refer to as STEM. So um, do you think that there actually needs to be a little more funding allocated towards social science and I know that it's not part of your job as science advisor <laughs> to make um, policy funding decisions but I was just wondering what your personal view was. I'm a supporter of STEAM so I think that we need to bring in all thinking and that siloing different subjects and calling them soft and hard isn't particularly helpful and I think that integration of all those different sciences in the same project is important. So rather than have a portion of money that says social science versus hard science, I'd rather say here's a program that's trying to address a question and let's make sure social science is fully integrated into that and that we can translate the findings not just into commercial outputs but also into policy outcomes to make a difference. And I think that's a really great message to give to aspiring scientists is that not to view the role as you know, I'm going to be always guided by the hard facts that come out of a, an experiment with my reagents in the lab that, you know, we have to put it in the context of being effective in the community. Would you have any advice for young people aspiring to be scientists based on, um, I guess, your vision for what the future role of scientists will be? 
listen, I think. So whichever type of science you're doing, just make sure that you're either listening directly or you're talking to the social scientists that are listening to the public and the communities that you're trying to serve. There's kind of been a narrative recently, perhaps of a little bit of mistrust around science, at least from what I've seen in the media. I was wondering if you sort of got a feel for that in your tour around the country or is there a bit of mistrust in science at all, do you think? Mostly I was talking to scientists. So um, the thing I focused on was getting them to ask that question. And it was quite a high priority topic as I traveled. People are starting to say, you know what, we've got some work to do here to earn that trust. Mm. Um, There's not any recent figures, I don't think, in New Zealand about whether people trust scientists. There's some in Australia. For the most part, most people trust science. But if you look what's happening in the States, I saw a frightening podcast over the weekend on flat earthers and the number of people that believe the earth is flat is growing in America. So those international trends, I don't think we can assume we're going to avoid them. How to counteract that with the sort of evidence base that there is, is is an interesting interplay. And so do you think that perhaps the responsibility of scientists around communicating that type of thing needs some work? Is, is it a, a, a communication problem from the scientists, perhaps? I think maybe it's a listening problem. So I think science has had a huge privilege for the last, what, 100 or so years where we became the experts and plotted graphs and waved fingers. And um, now information is so much more accessible to way more people. And so we can't pull rank we need mm. to listen to communities and say what problem are we trying to solve and how can we help you solve it or what opportunities can we create and how can we help you create it rather than distance ourselves from communities i think right and do you think that social media has an important role that sort of science should pick up a bit more i know a, a part of your um, focus has been starting to use twitter and things to try and engage yeah. more with the public so how have you found twitter and beyond that do you think there's other avenues for using social media in that regard I think there's huge potential. So Peter was a very active Twitter. I inherited his official feed. I've used it in a slightly different way. I've tried to be more interactive and less formal, probably. Uh, it's hard to know if you're successful on social media because you just live in your little echo chamber of sciencey people. So breaking out of that is a challenge. I also started an Instagram account to try and celebrate New Zealand science a bit more and how beautiful some of the images are so it's been great people have been sending me images hope they keep sending me them and just to just engage a different crowd but again how do you know who you're talking to Mm. if more people did it and more people did it in a a way that reached out beyond just science i think there's huge potential but i I forgot to ask about this previously but you mentioned steam versus stem Mm -hmm. so did you want to just talk a little bit more about that paradigm Uh, the a for arts so just just weaving in lots of different types of thinking so that's how it's quickly captured in a soundbite great and i remember reading a quote somewhere and this is terrible because every time we're podcasting we say oh i read i remember this quote and we don't remember who said it but it was that um i guess as human beings we weren't designed to be you know specialists in one subject we were designed to be polymaths and that you know it was it's important to develop a well-rounded personality where you can appreciate you know things that are maybe outside of your particular focus and i was wondering if there are concrete ways you could suggest that young people do this if they're preparing for careers yeah read widely i think and talk to lots of people from different subjects because that depth of knowledge is really important to get the best evidence in your discipline but understand that that's only one lens and one context the the best post it on my wall is one that says incommensurability of evidence it basically means that you can look at you can look at evidence in different ways and they're both equally valid but they might not add up to a useful answer to a societal question so just understand that you've only asked the question in one way and use one set of tools um, so thinking big picture and thinking future, is New Zealand science kind of heading in the right direction, do you think? Are we on the right track? Well, that's a good question. I think we really need to work on the social license piece. So that's my number one priority, is to persuade scientists that they need to get the public behind them. So fair to say we haven't been listening very well or been a bit arrogant maybe? And... We've probably listened as well as any scientist anywhere in the world, but <laughs> we've got an opportunity to do a lot better. And our particular cultural context gives us, I think, some really nice tools to do that. Yeah. So lots of the solutions that I was looking for around social license issues on tricky topics like 1080 and genetic modification where people are really locked into battle, 
lots of those communication communication tools exist in the Māori world already. Just getting everybody's views around the table, having a big hui, talking about it at the beginning, not the end, all those kind of ways of interacting. I think we can really learn from what happens on a marae, for example, to try and progress those conversations. Yeah, so we're taking steps, but they're kind of shaky steps at this stage, I guess. It's early days. Yes, there's some great people doing some great work, but it needs to spread. Were there any other things that you might want to discuss? This is, I guess, an open invitation for you to share thoughts and ideas with aspiring young scientists. Yeah, have fun. (laughs) (laughs) So it it should be fun. If if you're discovering new stuff and... um, if you want to be a scientist, you do it for love, not money. So make sure you're working on something that you find enjoyable. And I think that's a great place to end, Juliet. Well, I've certainly had fun um, chatting with you today. So thank you for taking your uh, time out of your busy schedule to join us. Namahinui. And to our listeners, we hope you've enjoyed this episode of It's a Science Life for Me as well. Please post a review and subscribe to our iTunes channel. And until next time, thanks for listening. Matewa. Matewa.